Awesome to welcome author, podcast host, founder, and creative mind behind TOC, JP Nurburn, to the Basketball Podcast. JP is a world-renowned leadership coach, sports consultant, and the visionary founder of TOC, a leading global sports consulting and coaching business. With an accomplished career as a professional basketball coach spanning over a decade, JP has solidified his expertise in team culture, drawing from his extensive background and knowledge. JP is also the author of numerous books, including The Culture System, and is the host of The Coaching Culture Podcast. His latest book is The Sport Parent Solution, Proven Strategies for Transforming Parents from Obstacles to Allies, and we will discuss that and more on the podcast. JP, welcome back to the Basketball Podcast. Hey, Chris, great to be here, man. Yeah, awesome to have you. Episode 105, coaches, go back, listen to it if you haven't. Great stuff there. And, you know, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. And the main thing, obviously, is this parent, the, the Sports Parent Solution, your new book. Tremendous. I've been able to read a lot of it. I've been able to see a lot of the information through your social media as well. What a topic. What inspired you to get into this topic? Man, it just kind of came right after my second book, The Culture System, that came out in 2022. I, I kind of already knew it was going to be a you know sequel right after because I was as I was writing The Culture System and explaining the framework around how we can build and sustain culture, parents were such an important part of that. So much so, I was like, oh man, it's going to make this book way too long. And so... I, I just said, hey, I'm going to write this as a separate book. So logistically, that was one thing. But another thing that happened that was really powerful was around the time of releasing the culture system, I actually, there, there's there's a story at the end of that book about a parent that just goes crazy on me and like tries to run me off the road with his car, essentially. <laughs> and it was a real tough moment in coaching, right? Like I was really committed to building a great culture and you know, transformational coaching and leadership and all that stuff. And here I was having like this kid that I loved and cared about. And this parent would totally did not appreciate my efforts. And so that, and this is a parent I knew for almost four or five years. So that happens. Well, around the release of the culture system, I get this text from this parent, this father, five years later, out of the blue, hasn't seen that story or read the book. I mean, he's not even like named it or anything like that. And he just says, I just want you to know all these years later, you're the best coach my son ever had. And not only did you help him become a great player, but a great person, but you helped me as a father become a better dad. You showed me how to discipline in a way that was demanding, but respectful. And that blew me away because all of a sudden I was like, all right, I knew parents were an important part of this equation, right? Like if we want to get the culture right, they can destroy it or they can actually really help and enhance it. But all of a sudden I was like, wow, not with every parent maybe, but with a lot of parents, actually they're watching my leadership example and that can impact them. And so I was extra inspired to, to obviously get to work on the book. Well, I love that story. And many of us have some crazy parent stories, but I think what gets lost is most parents are inherently not evil, are they? They're actually great allies. And I love that you connect that throughout the book that not only are they allies, we want to make them even better allies for us. Yeah, absolutely. I think most of us are parents and we know, man, this is the hardest job we've got, right? <laughs> Whatever about coaching being hard, like parenting today in today's world where the change is so rapid and there's so much, like we talk about the social media pressure for athletes. Well, there's pressure for parents. Like, and, and well, we'll look what that parent's doing and look at how well Johnny's doing or their daughter is doing. Like there's a lot of pressure out there. And so it can make some parents go a little crazy, right? I think we all have a bit of crazy sports parent in us. So we have a lot of really well-intentioned people that are struggling. We all struggle at this job. But when we start to partner and see them as an ally, man, like so often now, especially since writing the book and some of my work with coaches and my work with them, when an athlete is struggling and the coach can't seem to get through that athlete, one of my biggest questions is like, well, have you reached out to the parent? Like we're talking even like collegiate level athletes. Like have you connected with them? What are they seeing on their end? And how can we actually work with their, you know, the athlete's greatest influence in their life to actually support whatever challenge or obstacle that athlete's facing? And more often than not, when we do that, the, the, you know, engage the parent, it's really successful in two things. One is helping the athlete, but also getting ahead of this issue, which is so often like, let's say, you know, players playing time drops because their performance is down, their behaviors are down. 
and we don't communicate the parent, well, the parent comes back and is like, well, you're out to get against my child, right? Those types of narratives and stories get created in that parent's head. And we're actually able to kind of like get rid of those because we're actually proactive in that relationship. So you cover this throughout the book and you hit on it so well, so many times with different phrases and different stories and different examples. But this goes back like 25 years when I read studies and I keep reading these studies. The number one complaint parents have about coaches is not playing time, it's communication. And now that I'm a parent and a coach in a youth basketball system, I totally understand that. So talk to us about strategies for coaches to do better in this way, because parents are just trying to do their best to be able to get their son or daughters to different events, different practices, and be able to balance their lives as well. Yeah, when it comes to the communication, the level of transparency we have around the program, the culture we're building and playing time, I think sometimes we as coaches come in with this mindset, I know that I have, and I know a lot of my clients struggle with this, is we feel like there's sometimes some communication transparency, we're on the defense. Like we have to defend. And it's like, why should I have to defend every action I make? And I was talking to a coach just yesterday who was really strong with a player who was struggling with their playing time. He's like, why don't they just trust me? Why do I have to explain every decision? And I'm like, let's try to not see this defense. Let's try to see this as actually helping the athlete. They're unable to deal with the uncertainty, the, the lack of understanding why they're not playing. And so when they come out of a game, there's a lot of narratives that go in their head that whether they're true or not, right? We, we could really help them sort those out if we just communicate, hey, that was a performance issue. That was a behavior issue. That was a rotational just to subs, you know, something like that. So you see that with the athletes is just by, let's not take a defensive stance. Let's take a proactive stance to help them to support to support them, right? And so it's the same with parents, right? So one of the big things that I think is really important when it comes to communication is early in the relationship, communicating your philosophy, the way you're going to build culture, all those things, really kind of getting into the nitty gritty. I even have coaches running X's and O's clinics now for the parents, right? Whether it's via Zoom or they're brought in, 30 minutes to an hour, just to understand how we play the game, why we teach the game this way, why we coach the game this way. It's not to be defensive. It's just to help educate them to understand. The second big thing is early on, yeah, we need to set boundaries around conversations that we're not going to have, but we need to also communicate conversations that we want to have, right? When they can reach out to us. And, and those conversations need to be around the athlete's well-being. They need to be around the athlete's, you know, potentially things they might be struggling with, things the parents are observing. I'm even now a person that's open to the conversation around playing time if you know, for have that once or twice in a year, if it's that big of a problem, because the last thing I want is this passive aggressive email. That's not about playing time, but really is about playing time that comes down to the, you know, the pipe three months later in the season. And this frustration is built up and this parents in the stands and they're bad mouthing me or the players. And it just be, gets messy. I want to get ahead of those things. So communicate the conversations we want to have, and also be really radically transparent around how we're building the culture, how we're approaching the game, the X's and O's, those types of things only help our, our case as coaches. So this is where it connects for me with everything you share about culture, which is as a coach, we wouldn't expect players to learn our culture with one speech at the beginning of the year or one email at the beginning of the year. But for some reason with parents, we say, well, I sent that in an email at the beginning of the year you know, <laughs> and that's not the case, isn't it? So there has to be this constant communication. So talk to us, not just about that, but how you balance that with not monopolizing parents and players time, which is obviously that fine line. And you mentioned that struggle in the book as well. Yeah. You know, I, I think when it comes to so much of the communication in season throughout the season, there's two ways that I encourage coaches to, to really communicate. One is whatever that weekly email it is that you do, right? Obviously you want to include the logistics, but there needs to be a lot of cultural elements of that. What are we working on culturally? Maybe there's a reflection on the previous week's game. There's a reflection on the upcoming games. There's what are you working on tactically or technically? What did you learn from that loss? What did you learn from that big win, right? So you might give them a little bit of insight into just how you're approaching it. This sounds like a arduous task. And, and granted, a lot of my clients spend 30 minutes to an hour on a Sunday writing these emails out, right? To parents. I have coaches at the collegiate level, they're still sending this out to parents. So you see a lot of these different, this takes time, but actually the coaches that are doing this are like, man, it's really beneficial for me to sit down and actually reflect on how the week, week went and to articulate that in a way that other people can understand it. So the one thing is through that kind of that weekly email. The second thing is through personal touches. 
Now this could be a text message, a phone call, an email. It could be just, you see them before, after a game, before, after a practice, but just going up to a parent and more proactive, positive communication, letting them know something their son or their daughter has done that you're really, that they should be proud of that you, them. it could be just simply, Hey, thanks for all the support you've been given this year. Or thanks for coming to the games. You know, thanks for allowing me to coach your son or your daughter, right? Just the attitude of gratitude can just be really transformational. And then you're doing those positive deposits, right? On the flip side is sometimes, hey, there's been an issue. It's kind of reaching out to them, pick up the phone and, and calling and saying, or a text and just saying, hey, this happened in practice yesterday. We're dealing with it, but we want you to be aware, right? We've got a bit of some challenges with your son or daughter. You don't even have to mention it to them. So those type of proactive, like individual communications go a long way. I have a lot of coaches that have a, a, a standard for themselves. Anytime they have a one-to-one -one check in that's five minutes or longer with a the player, they will have some sort of follow-up communication with a parent. Next, sometimes that's a lot, it's just positive. It's just, hey, just let you know your son or your daughter, and they're doing so good lately. Just had a great chat with them. Hope hope it's all as well on your end. Like it could be just a 30-second text. And that's type of that type of relationship building has done enormous things, especially for players who are at the end of your bench. The players at the end of your bench, well, coach doesn't value them because he's not playing them. Well, coach does because he's actually keeping us in touch with all the one-on-ones he's having with my son or my daughter, how they're you know documenting their progress and the things that they're trying to work on them with. I love it. I love that example that you just gave as well. And look, I, there's so much good stuff in this book, but the one thing that I think you nailed that uh, is just brilliant is this concept of sharing the conversations you want to have with parents. You know, we always talk to parents about the conversations they're not allowed to have with us. You can't talk to me after games. You can't talk about this. You can't talk about that. And you really do rewire my brain and our brains in terms of how we should communicate to parents because I love this. So can you highlight some of that and uh, talk a little bit about where that came from? Yeah, I, I I was the guy that had the slide, like these are the conversations I won't have. And I remember there's this one one time where I had a mother reach out because the son was really upset and embarrassed about something I had done. I had made a joke with another player. This player thought the joke was on that and him. Wasn't at all, but he went home thinking, coach is making fun of me to the other guys. All right Now he's 18 years old and he's embarrassed by this. He doesn't want to have a conversation with me. And I think it's really important for young men to learn to have, have hard conversations with their coaches, their boss, right? Their different teachers. But he did not feel safe enough to have that conversation. Some of that's on me as a coach to build that relationship. And I had it, right? But either way, the mother reached out to me and said, hey, this is what happened. He's really upset. And I go, oh, that's not what happened at all, right? I, and so that was a big turning point for me. It's like, how many times are those conversations, like th that communication not happening? And I look back at it and I'm like, man, there are so many times where two months, three months after an event, I'm hearing from a parent where I have done something, their perception of what I've done, whether it's playing a player over this player, organizing a practice time. I mean, just a lot of little things where it's like they perceived my actions one way. It changed their opinion of me, their, of, of my character, right? Like, and, and I haven't been able to get ahead of that. And that's stewed for so long. So the three, five conversations I always tell the parents I want to have is, I will talk if you don't understand why your child's not playing. You don't have to agree. I'm going to communicate to your son and if and it's and your daughter. And if they have communicated that to you and you still don't understand, I'm open to having a, one or two conversations throughout the year. If something has happened at home, I want to know about it. I've had parents going through divorces. I've had fathers in jail that I didn't know about for months, right? So I've had these types of things. I want to know if they're coming home and they're miserable right? They're not enjoying their experience. They're thinking about quitting. Hey, bring me in on that. I want to know if I've done something that has changed your opinion of me as a person. You can think I'm a bad coach. That's fine. But if you all of a sudden go, man, he is an asshole, then I'm going to be like, all right, I'd like to kind of know so that I can at least a fix my behavior or help you understand what was going on. Well, I love that. And what, what kind of all this kind of connects for me too, is that it is kind of exhausting to be a really effective coach, isn't it? Yeah. But, he, but you know, here's the thing. When you say like, oh, this is the big pushback on that. Is JP, you do that. All of a sudden you're going to have your phone blown up. Man, I, I have not experienced that with any of my coaches I work with or my, myself, right? We, we open the doors there. 
we're making, we're, when we're doing all the things in, in, I talk about within the system, right? So the sports parent solution is really built off of the system that I propose in the culture system to establish support and to kind of enforce, right? As long as we're, we're, we're doing all these things, we're actually going to have less issues downstream. And, and what my experience has been is coaches get less emails, less complaints, better feedback at the end of the season, and they're not being pulled into their administrator's office going, what's going on here? And so with this, a bit of upstream work, you have a lot less work downstream. And I think that's that's just trying to build it out you know, as much as we can. So my experience, coaches' inboxes are a lot less full you know, when they take this approach. Well said. And why is expressing gratitude important in coaching, especially towards parents? You know, I think Anson Dorn's taught me, you know, well, he really reinforced this for me. The guy's got 21 national championships, you know, and, and he told me an amazing story once where, you know, he had just won the national championship and he had a parent the next day. And, and he's like, dude, we, we tried that the year before and we didn't win the national championship. Now we put it on the bench and we win, you know, but, but this parent. So he taught me two things. One is that parents, no matter how successful you are, you're going to have parents that complain, right? The guy's got 21 national championships. He's still got parents that complain. We also talked, taught me that here, he's got 21 national championships and yet he still has an attitude of gratitude. He still says, you know what? I owe the parents in some regard because the parents have helped them to become the players they are, right? That they are today. They've taken them all the tournaments. They've invested in their careers. Great players, not just because of great coaches, because of the parents' support. And I think that, you know, when I drop my kids off to a practice, right? I'm entrusting that coach with a lot, right? I'm to, for their safety, for their health, for their development as a person, as well as an athlete. And they're giving a lot of their time, right? I get that and I should be appreciative of them, but there's still a bit of like, I'm kind of vulnerable in my giving over my kids to them and I'm putting that trust in that. And so as a coach, I, I've come to appreciate like, man, I, I really appreciate the parents that are trusting me with their kids, right? They've chose to send their kid to my team, my club, my college, right? Whatever it is. And so just by shifting our mindset a little bit, a little bit, it, I think it really opens up the, the possibilities of in that partnership. It's harder to be angry when you're grateful as well, isn't it? A absolutely. But it's also it, it, when you're, when you're grateful and, and you show, express that they're more likely to be grateful in return as well too. Right. And it, it, it brings more joy into that relationship. They're more likely to be behind you. Love it. You mentioned leading by example already, but in regards to that, how do you believe a coach's actions and reactions and influence both players and parents? Because I think that's at the foundation of all of this, that our actions and reactions do influence them, don't they? Yeah. One thing I like to challenge coaches on is like, if you couldn't say anything to your, the parents in your program, if you're, the only way you could, it was by your actions, what would your actions be saying? Right. And to really reflect on that, like what, what would those, what would those be saying? And so if as a coach, we're ripping on the referees or we're laying into the players every time on a sub, you know, a substitution, right. We're modeling what we believe is acceptable behavior. They're more likely to get on the referees. They're more likely to get on their son or their daughter in a car. And so I think it really comes down to a lot of making sure that we're setting the example that we want them to follow, right? And I think that that goes a long way. I think also it's it's really coming back to, it's very easy to come up with a mission statement or answer the question, why do I coach? It's really easy to come up with a vision statement. The hard work in leadership is saying, okay, this is the impact I want to have. This is the culture I want to create. Players, for the parents, for anyone that's a part of our program. And then for us to go out there and make sure that we are setting that example, we're working towards that day in and day out. And, and I think that's where we have to really be much more reflective and much more self-aware than more often than not, we aren't as leaders. I may be paraphrasing a quote from your book, but you basically said, imagine if every parent behaved like you as a coach, what would the culture look like? And that is a great way to kind of twist it back to yourself as a coach and say, yeah, what would it look like? Well, so often it is what's going on. Do you know, like, I mean, I, if you go and you observe so many games, you know, the, the, the coaches getting all over the referees and then the parents start getting on the players start getting on the referees. And it's like, then it becomes this big, big mess, you know? And so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great point. 
So one of the things that stands out to me is like this, this interaction of parents and games and the AAU program that our daughters go to a lot of parents, you know, cause they have to drive their kids a half hour. They sit and watch practice. I have no issues with that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But what they don't do in practice is they don't coach their kids in practice, but in games, suddenly they start coaching their kids. And it seems to be this one thing. It's like either coach them in both settings or don't coach them at all. And it's easy to say, don't coach them at all, but we know how parents react. So talk to me a little bit about that challenge. Yeah. I think that really is honestly age dependent, you know, and I think that's context dependent. I honestly, I'm, I'm coaching under eights here in Ireland for my daughter's team. And I am trying to communicate to the parents, Hey, this is what we're working on. So if you see your daughter out there, try to reinforce, this is what we want to be reinforcing. I'm letting them know what our focus or our success criteria for the game are so that they can offer those types of encouragement. You got, you know, and I'm coaching football. So it's, you know, there's 15 players out there. You're trying to, it's very hard to kind of communicate. So anytime a little reinforcement, that's the right of reinforcement. I don't mind at that age group. When it comes to the older levels, I, I think before you can go in and start challenging the sports parent around their parenting, you need to build a relationship. And so what we actually like to do with a lot of our programs at the high school and even the collegiate level is we run a parent practice. So we like to have the parents come and maybe watch, maybe they observe part of a practice. We kind of teach them how we practice, why we practice. And then we have them put their, have their sneakers on. We say, all right, now you're out here. And we have oftentimes the players might put them through through some drills. They might do some competition. I mean, I've had Division One lacrosse team have the dads out there competing with them, and then we do some sort of social fun event after. These type of events are really help to build that relationship with you, the coach, the parents, as well as parents to parents, parents to other athletes, and start to develop that culture where everyone's supportive of each other. So once you start to build that relationship, then I think coaches can say, "Hey, this is what." our athletes need from you during the games. And the best way to communicate those needs is to turn to your athletes and say, athletes, what do you need from us as coaches to be successful this season? And what do you need from your parents to be successful this season? And so they have the athletes sit down, work out that list, hand it to you. And then you can communicate that to the parents and say, Hey, this is what they've asked for, right? They've asked this for us. This is our, their expectations of us. And this is their expectations of you. And so it kind of helps to, you know, set some standards. We also, I do some workshops with parents from time to time of teams, you know, the high school level and we'll co-create parent standards. So I'll actually have the parents say, what are our standards for parents' behavior during games and stuff like that? And parents are pretty, pretty smart. They know they shouldn't say anything. Like I know I shouldn't say anything when I'm going and watching my daughter or my son, but I have this urge to say something when I see them doing something wrong. I think it's natural in all of us. So they know it's just, it's great to formally kind of say, Hey, we're not going to do that here. And that's like the kid that says, Hey, well, I don't want my parent to talk at all, but really the issue is not what the the parent talking, the, the issue is what the parent is saying. And that's what you're trying to get them to understand is what can they actually say in the game that reinforces what you're trying to do and what your player is trying to do and adds value instead of taking it away. Yeah. And it's like I said, everything's so contextual. So like, I mean, you could be at the high school level, you could, you know, and you could, be communicating your email. Hey, this is what we're working on. If you're out there, obviously we want to be encouraging. If you feel the need to coach, you know, like this is what we're really emphasizing is, you know, running the lanes wide today, right? Like maybe you're that type of coach that you want to bring the parents that much into the fold. Maybe you're not, right? Maybe you want to keep them more of a distance. Like, hey, we just, we just want you there to encourage. For those coaches, I actually had a coach up in Wisconsin. He, he would give a, a ba- big bag of Tootsie Pops to one parent, a different parent every game. And that parent had to go around and give the Tootsie Pops out to the other parents, which is a reminder when you wanted to criticize the referees or say something bad, you just, you know, put the Tootsie Pop in your mouth, right? And it was just kind of a fun way, though, like of of reminding parents, hey, what's your job here today, right? What's your role? And it was was just kind of a cool thing that really helped to create it in a positive way. Well, I like that approach. And uh, the other approach that kind of this connects to is that you talk in your book about turn your preseason parent meeting into an experience. And you kind of just referenced that in terms of your turning your practice into an experience for your parents as well. So build on that for us. Yeah. I mean, it looks different for everyone. Um, but the interesting thing is I, I work in a lot of different sports, coaching different coaches in that, that area. So we've had swim coaches do a parent practice, right? We've had lacrosse, we've had ice hockey, even just last week. So, you know, we've got a lot variety 
But the idea is like, you got that preseason parent meeting, which everyone hates. The coach hates the parents mate. Everyone shows up. They stick to themselves. There's very little interaction. It's like, how can we create a lot of collisions and connections there? Right. Yeah. We got to go through this, this stuff around how we're going to build culture and our philosophy. And we got these things that we got to do here, but how can we make this an event that everyone looks forward to it? So yeah, we do practice or that practice looks a lot different. Sometimes it's the coach running it. Sometimes it's the players running the practice. It's just, it's a lot of fun. We do, we like to see like a team photo shoot where we get all like, a, you know, like the team photos are taken, but the parents also get to be in the photos. We like to do other team building activities. What we're driving at is connection because at the end of the day, what we want and what we, what we see right now and the results that we're getting in so many cultures is parents sitting by themselves, parents not sharing for the other kids' parents. And we want a place where parents show up. They know each other's names. They know about the other kids. They've, they've spent time with them, right? They've shared a meal with them. They've been coached by that, that athlete, right? Potentially in a practice. They're, they have a you know some sort of moment that, that connects them, some sort of inside joke from that experience. And so we're building these connections. And when we see that, it just sets the stage for everyone to be more about the team, which is probably the most frustrating thing for us as coaches when it comes to sports parents today is they show up and they're only about their child. And my challenge to all of us is what are we doing for them to better understand and appreciate the other children, the other young men and young women within the program. And so that's what this is about. And from a parent perspective, it's not wrong because inherently, obviously, you want your child to succeed, but we want to connect them with the bigger picture of how they succeed by being a part of this team and supporting the whole team. So can you give us a few more specific strategies for that? Because I think that's such an important point you made. Yeah. So one real simple way was in the actual co-creation of the standards that I talked about earlier, when you get parents together and say, hey what do we need to do as parents to create a great experience for our athletes? Just ask them that question this season. And I, we broke them in a group and we do this a lot, but we break them into groups and I pass around. We pass everyone group has a note card and they write down three standards. They share them and we, the coach takes that and compiles them. Well, I was doing this one workshop and, and the parents said, well, we need to support the other kids. And every group was like, we need to support the other kids. So everyone knew that. And I said, okay, what does it actually look like? And this one, this one dad says, you know, Johnny's dad over here, he points over to Johnny's dad. He always, after games, goes up to other players, other on the team, not his own son, and just seems to just say something positive. He said it to my son one day and it like really helped him out a lot. And that the, the parents were like, yeah, 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 he does a great job of that. He's like, well, that should be our standard. So now they have a rule in that program. After the game, no parent can go directly to their child. The standard is they go to another child and they have to say something that that kid did well. And that was three years ago. I went back to the school last, this, this, you know, two months ago and they brought up and said, no, that's something we still want to do together. And so something like that is really, really powerful. It doesn't need to always be on the coach though. I think one thing too, is just trying to find parents that do want to be proactive in the program that do want to be engaged and say, Hey, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you want to help us out with some of the team stuff, you know, the team meals and that, but can you help organize the parents for some team social events that could be grabbing a bite to dinner, a bright bite to eat before a game. It's going out after a game. We've got different socials like that. It could be parents hosting other parents. It could be in the cafeteria, you know, doing stuff there. It's, it's in the college level. We've got college coaches that run, you know, social events for parents, you know, to get to know each other, inter- inducting the freshmen. So you have all these ways of going about that, but it's just working with a parent in your, or a few parents in your program for them to organize it. It doesn't need to always be on you as a coach as well. Share your coaching philosophy, simple concept. But what I love about it is that you highlight the fact that you as a coach should share your story. And I've always felt that's been an important part of my communication to people is to understand why I do what I do is to share my story. And that helps connect parents to you as a human being. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it, People will forget the mission statement or the the catchy phrases sometimes you drop, the cliches. But if you can share a bit of your story and some of that is not this perfect resume story that, you know, it's it's the maybe some of the low points in your coaching that you've learned the most, maybe the places where you've fallen short as a leader, or maybe some of those negative experiences that you have had as an athlete. So sharing those is what people will really listen in. They'll really lean in on that and they'll remember that. 
And it, it definitely captures them some more and definitely helps them to see you more as a person. And I think that's really important in coaching. I think so often athletes and, and parents, especially just see you as the coach. They forget that you're a, a husband or father or mother spouse, right? They forget that human element to you. So I actually like to even see coaches if they have kids to share their own parenting mistakes along the path, you know, and their own sh- challenges as well there. And, you know, all of this connects back to one of the most challenging things as an adult, not just a coach is to set your boundaries and to hold people to your boundaries. And that's a really challenging thing, not just in coaching, obviously in marriage, I've had to learn that quite a bit and those different things. So give us some pointers for that. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously like the the very common things like the 24 hour rule, you know, that, and I always like to, one thing I'll, I'll just mention the 24 hour rules. I don't, I always tell hey, parents, that's not for you. That's for me. Like after a tough loss, like I'm, I might be hot, you know, it's just a one way of like making that a rule. That's more about a two ways, not kind of blocking parents out. But you know, in the book, I, I go through a lot of different strategies around how to have those conversations when it comes to the boundaries. However, this looks, you need to get with your administration in many cases around how parent conflict is going to be dealt with. And so it's very, things very contextual, but you know, working with your administration early on around when a parent wants a meeting, those types of things, what you do, when a parent's behavior is unacceptable, what do we, how do we handle that? Uh, I think administrations need to be stronger. They need to be stepping up more to enforce certain behaviors in the stands from parents these days, you know, because we have a duty and responsibility to protect all the athletes in the environment that we're trying to create for them. I don't think there's enough accountability for parents in that regard. So there, there's that element. I think the, the other aspect is just how do you engage in difficult conversations? And my, my formula is always listen first, right? Listen first, ask questions, understand their perspective, really let them feel heard. When we ask great questions, I mean, I've had coaches that have done this so well that a parent just in that asking of questions has been like, you know what? I'm sorry. I even came to you that I'm realizing how silly what I'm bringing up to you is ask questions, share your perspective as observations and assessments and separate the two, share the facts and share what you are seeing, what your assessment is a coach. We're seeing these numbers. Our assessment is he's not good enough to start. Lastly, ask this powerful question of what can we do to support your child moving forward? Because the consequences or their playing time, their role may not change because of this conversation. So we want to support them though, moving forward. So what can we do better in that? Like, obviously you said context matters, obviously, and that's true depending on the ages. Mostly when you communicate with parents, it should it be this one-on-one communication with the parent or should the player be involved? Massively in support of the, the player is involved in that conversation. And when we have a player involved in that conversation, you're asking them to share their perspective as well, right? So you're, you're incorporating that. There are certain situations, certain contexts where you're not having that, right? The parents reaching out directly and, and so you, you may not have that, right? So like you said, contextually is different, but the more we can get the player in the room, the better. What I also recommend, and I discussed exactly how to do this in the book extensively, is that this that, that the conflict moment is not the first time that you, the parent, and the athlete have sat down. So for college coaches, even high school coaches in the recruitment process, all three of you or four of you are in a room together, but also early in the season, at least making it an option for a parent-athlete coach conference. So doing that type of thing where you're asking the athlete what their goals are, what their expectations are, asking the parents what th- their hopes are for the season, you're able to share your perspective, So you kind of ground expectations. I think every parent athlete tends to probably have a little bit too of high expectations going into the season as far as how well their child is going to perform that year, how much playing time they're going to get, what their role is going to be. Everyone seems to be a little bit more optimistic than they probably should be. And so if we can ground some of those expectations early on, I think it also helps to avoid less of those conflict situations later. But if if those conversations do happen, you do have a situation where you have to pull a parent in and say, hey, we're seeing some stuff or we're hearing some stuff that you're really frustrated with. Or if the parent calls that meeting, you can reference back to some of the maybe agreements that you set out early on, which we really try to do in that initial meeting of like, Hey, this is how we're going to communicate. This is our expectations. These are our standards here. 
And those agreements you can come back to and say, hey, remember that conversation we had in October, right? Well, here we're in this situation. And so you can reference those kind of expectations. You referred to this already, and I think it's so important in this uh, modern landscape. Mental health obviously is a big picture challenge for all of us. And you already mentioned that we want to know the situations that are happening in our player. So talk to us about how we can create this safe environment for not just a player, but for parents to be able to communicate some of these challenges that may be happening. Yeah, I, I think we got to, so I would go back to a few other things early on is just the, the conversations we want to have. I'd go back to the proactive communication, checking in, you know, throughout the year, sharing observations that we're having. The other thing I think we often do in a lot of our programs is oftentimes just a weekly check-in on, you know, mental health check-in, like Google form that can just easily be copied, replaced and sent out. I mean, you're talking about a one minute process to, cut, you know, duplicate the Google form or use the same link, send it out to players, fill it out and then check the responses around where players are currently feeling when it comes to their anxiety and mental health. So you're doing some check-ins like that. The, the thing that I think is one of the things I probably haven't mentioned yet, and I think is really powerful in, in this regard is just early on in that relationship, asking parents this really powerful question of what are your greatest concerns for your son or your daughter in the next year, the next five years of their life? And sometimes you get just a very cliche, well, not say cliche, just a very standard response. Oh, I'm worried about them getting to the right school or getting right out, getting a job, you know, those types of things. But every once in a while, like on every team, some parent is going to tell you around something in their family that is really challenging and proposing, posing, could pose some issues for that, that young man or that young woman's, you know, mental health, even physical health. And so I think that question alone brings forth a lot of things that help us to be more aware of some maybe struggles. Well, that's why you're so great for the coaching community is you just share gold, like practical examples, like that Google form. It seems so simple and it's just a great way to be able to do it. And I love that. So thanks for sharing that. And obviously so much else, but look, I, it's been on my mind for a long time. And I got to ask uh, someone who has dealt or has been in this culture consultant space for so long. What are some of the top mistakes that coaches make when it comes to culture? Because I still think, again, like this is a huge challenge and it's obviously always on people's mind because I see it all always all over social media. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. There's three things I would say that I see are common and I'm guilty of all of them. So if you feel like I'm calling you out, coaches, trust me, I've done them all multiple times. The first is we look for that silver bullet. You know, it's it's interesting. You, you see Shaka Smart has all the success at Marquette. And now what does everybody want to do? They want to, every, every coach in the country, I feel like is charting energy giving behaviors. Like that's like, how are you going to be cult, build culture this year? Oh, we're going to chart, you know, energy giving behaviors. Cause you know, they're doing it over Marquette. It's like, that's not how you build culture. And if you think that's how he builds culture, then you're ignoring so many of the other great things that he does consistently, consistently build his culture. So looking for the silver, silver bullet culture is a system. It's complex, right? And the second thing is we forget about our own development. We think that listening to podcasts and, you know, watching videos around plays, we think that, you know, reading books, even just reading a book is, is development. I mean, yeah, it takes in more knowledge, but development is growing in our ability to be more aware of what's going on for us. It's more awareness of others and our ability to regulate and shift ourselves, our own states, as well as others' states. Like that's great leadership, right? And so you're really about developing skills, not necessarily knowledge when it comes to development, right? So, and I think that there's a big difference. I mean, I think you can definitely make the comparison in basketball. There's a guy who knows all the X's and O's, but he can't teach it, right? He doesn't have the skill set to teach it or make the decisions, right? It's the same in leadership. I think the other third thing that I would mention is that we're very downstream and reactive with issues. I remember like as a young coach, when it came to problems in the season. Let's say we got out rebounded in one game and it cost us and we lost the game. What did we do the next day? We did rebounding drills for an hour. Right. But like, I would think that was going to solve my rebounding problem. But the problem was we hadn't worked on rebounding all year. So eventually I said, okay, you know, I can, I'm be committed to rebounding. So the next year what I do, I do rebounding drills every day for 10 minutes. And I think that's going to fix it. But the problem is then you're going to ignore other things. And so you learn to incorporate rebounding drills and every drill, like you're going to work on rebounding and a lot in some ways, a lot of other things. So I 
think the same as in culture. You know, you have a behavioral issue and you want to do the team building activity to fix it. You want to have the come to Jesus meeting to fix it. It's like, man, sometimes you're already a little bit too far gone. Like you have to go back upstream and start working and focusing on the system. And so we get so reactive to cultural issues. And it's like, man, there's so many of these things that we can just foresee, right? We, if we just spend like, even just simple, a player walks in and I pick up on his body language. He's disengaged today. Oh man, I just stew. And I'm like, I'm ready to jump on him the second he doesn't work hard. It's like, no, why don't you just pull him over and ask him what's going on, right? So there's reactive, we're, we're, we're not, we can get upstream in a single day. We can get upstream in the year, but so often we're just downstream and, and we're very reactive as coaches. Great points, great examples. And, you know, for, for you, you, you talked earlier about behavioral being obviously one of the challenges for coaches. And one of the challenges, obviously, it's it's kind of, it's an easier conversation, I imagine, to talk about technique and tactics and skill with a parent. But when it comes to behavioral problems with their child, what are some solutions or better ways to be able to communicate with them so that, again, they don't get on the defensive and that we work towards co-creating that solution for that player? Yeah. So have we made some deposits in that relationship? So you just go back to all the stuff we talked about earlier. If Absolutely. you made some deposits, you're now are, you're already walking into a much better situation where they know that you're supportive of their child. You're not out to get their child. The second thing is just to share what we're noticing, right? I, I love the word notification. I talk a lot about it extensively in the book, The Culture System, and or just I'm I'm noticing this. What are you what are you what are you picking up on? What's your take on that? I'm noticing your son is continuously at practice. I'm noticing he's disengaged. I notice his effort has been really down lately. Or just sharing what you're as observation. Hey, we're really observing lately in practice, or we're really struggling with these types of things. So just sharing the the more facts and then reflecting back with a question of just what can you tell us about this? Has he struggled this in this with other teams? Have other coaches struggled with him? Is this a new challenge, right? So just by coming in there with a bit of curiosity, right? You already are starting to co-create that relationship where you'll start to address that that the, the problem, right? Instead of just coming in with pure judgment. So just share the observation and ask a great question. Is is there ever a, a hard line in the sand type of conversation? Does it ever get to that point where it's like, I'm sorry you feel that way. We're just never going to see eye to eye. This is how we're doing it. And if you're not on board, then you need to make a decision. Absolutely. And, and this, this happens probably a lot less than usual, but you know, when you do all these, you know, proactive things, I think you mitigate some of those issues because people are more bought into what you're doing. But I've had coaches that I work with that have said, had to say, Hey, listen, I know I've had an open door policy around these things, but now this is, this is being abused. Right. And so if you want to have a check-in, we can have a check-in this periodically, but outside of that, we need to have your son start to deal with some of these challenges, right? So there's drawing a line of sand in, in a kind of a softer way that way. And there's been other moments where, I mean, I have, there's a great story of a client that I work with, a high school coach. He's a young coach. He's probably 27 at the time, first year head coach. And he's not playing one of these two twins that are seniors at the high school. And the father calls a meeting, he gets in there, destroys the coach, just lays into him with administrators, the whole lot. You know, we've all probably been into one of those meetings and this young coach stands his ground. And it's just like, Hey, I, he asks a lot of questions. He shares back what he's heard. And he says, well, this is our, this is how we do things here. That's not going to change. What can we do to support him moving forward? Now it goes back to that formula, right? Ask, share perspective, and then let's partner to get our support. Well, this, this dad didn't want to have anything to do with it. A week later, pulls his kids out of the program. Right. So it, it, it drew a line of sand. Like, we're not going to change. We're not going to drop our standards for, we're not going to play your son just because he's a senior and because he's been around. We're playing players based on performance. So you draw a sand, line of the sand and let them let, let make a choice. It, it, it has to happen. And mostly what you're saying is, again, like, because you're having this communication and you've presented all these possibilities before, that it is their choice and that's the way it should be phrased. It's not me throwing players off the team and me throwing, you know, you know, doing these, throwing people out of practice. It's, it's, it's a choice that people are making to not be a part of the standard, the expectation that you're creating. It's exactly how we talk about it with our players. Right. And I'm big on logical consequences with, with athletes, which is I'm not, I, we are never kicking you out of practice. You, I'm asking you to step off until you're ready to meet the standard. 
right? You're choosing not to meet the standards. So you're choosing to leave practice. Like it's your choice, right? We're, we're saying here, you have a choice. And when you do this, you know, it, it, it it's less triggering for the individual, right? In, in one regard. And, and secondly, it honestly helps them be more motivated to, to, to make that change because we're not trying to control them. There are some cases where we've had coaches that have worked with administrators and they've re- suspended a parent from a game for a certain amount of, amount of days or, or a whole season. We had a situation where a parent absolutely blasted a parent through, or sorry, a parent blasted a coach through a bunch of texts and emails, you know, bowling. And the AD just stepped and said, you're no longer allowed to attend ten your, your son or your daughter's games the rest of the season because of your behavior. You know, we've spoken to you about this. And, and so that's really sad and it stinks for that kid, but that was the parent's choice, right? You know, to act like that. And so we have to hold them accountable to those types of things. So it's, once again, it's their choice to, to behave that way or to, to not be a part of the program. JP, I've heard you talk about this culture as a system. So can, can you cure my curiosity and share a little bit more about what you mean when you talk about that? Yeah. So there's a, there's a great quote from W Edwards Deming, where he said, you know, every system gets the results it's designed to get, right. You know, it, it, it's perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And so culture is a system, which is what makes up a culture. Yeah. It's the behaviors, but it's also the processes. It's the way that you do things in your program. It's the way that you establish your standards or you dictate rules or how you build relationships or you don't build relationships and you just hope that they happen, right? So all your processes, your procedures, your methods, the ways that you do things in your program, you know, and also the influences of of people around it. So it's really, really complex. And it's even harder today to create a great culture because of the rate of change. The rate of change in today's world is so fast. I mean, look at college basketball in the last five years alone. And and now you're going to have a rate of change in high school basketball that is going to be pretty darn fast too, I think, as well, because as a result of that. So the thing is, we cannot rely on what worked 50 years ago. Yeah, there's some principles that are always timeless, but leadership today is just so fast and evolving. So it's very hard to get ahead of that. Now, there's there's two things I would offer coaches in this. One is when we think about the culture as a system is that we can influence the system. And so that is that we start to get in and say, how are we establishing relationships? How are we establishing standards? How do we support those standards? How do we support those relationships throughout the year? How do we enforce that? And make sure that the ways that you're doing that are intentional and they're backed by proven methods, right? As much as we possibly can. So you try to get in there and be proactive in in addressing your system. The other thing is that we have to recognize that we don't have control over the outcome, right? We don't, we are not, you know, the, the leader, just because you have a struggling culture doesn't necessarily always reflect your leadership, right? Just because you have a great culture doesn't necessarily always reflect your leadership as well too. It's like you have that and it's the same, right? So and when it comes to talent and winning and all that. So try to imagine yourself as con- a condition creator, not an outcome creator, right? And so just what can you do to create the conditions for good things to happen within your team? And, and so that's that I always think that question helps me to get more upstream, more focused on the system rather than downstream focusing on just it's the latest tool or trick that we heard this championship winning coach did over there. It's it's not just the practical ideas, which again, you knock it out of the park throughout your books with those, but it's also the phrasing. It's just tremendous because again, I know you've spent so much time in these spaces interacting with different populations from around the world that it just helps you refine your language and refine your phrasing. And I, and I say that from someone that has had a lot of experiences similar to that. And that is the beauty of what you've been able to do is that from all these different shared experiences, it just brings back a tremendously concise communication that is very deliberate. And I thank you for that. And I got to imagine that's one of the, the, the things that you're grateful for as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's something I guess you, we, we all try to work at as much as we can as, as tightening that up so that others can can take it in. And And I think that, you know, what I've seen my role at since I left, you know, kind of high school basketball coaching before I coached a little at the pro level is really been, how can I help shortcut some of the learning, you know, that coaches have to do oftentimes and, and rather than read all these different things, listen to all these podcasts and figure out some sort of culture plan is just, and I know that's what your work's about too, Chris, is just how can I help 
coaches with limited time and resources become really effective in their roles. Absolutely. You do an outstanding job of that. And your latest book, The Sports Parent Solution, Proven Strategies for Transforming Parents from Obstacles to Allies, uh, just tremendous coaches. Uh, you can find it everywhere. But uh, JP, give us an idea of some of the other things that coaches can connect with you on. Yeah. If you haven't read my previous book, The Culture System, I highly recommend that because The Sports Parent Solution is really kind of a sequel to that. I mean, you could read Sports Parent Solution by itself and it'd be fine. You can follow me on Instagram at TOC Culture. You can follow me on Twitter, Twitter or X at JP Nurbin, N-E-R-B-U-N. The website's tocculture.com. We've got a podcast that's all about culture. We actually don't have too many coaches on it. I'd say 20% of our guests are our coaches. It's more like other thought leaders in the world and on leadership, behavioral science, you know, those types of things. So, but we, we talk about things on culture. That's the coaching culture podcast, but yeah, the website's tocculture.com. And, you know, you can go there and you can reach out to me through that as well. JP, thanks for joining us. And thanks for being such a tremendous resource for all of us coaches around the world. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity and, and a big white man. So thank you.